seated. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you today. Getting ready for the heat. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was running a little slow. I was out in the parking lot finding the Poke Monsters. No. <laughs> Bill Dutton told me this one on stage. I said, no, that's the guitar player. <laughs> God is good, amen. It's an amazing world we live in. Last week, we started a new series dealing with leadership and the call to leadership, taking it from the book of Nehemiah. Remember, in 586 B.C., the city of Jerusalem was completely destroyed. The Medes and the Persians had come in and carried away for 70 years of captivity, basically, the Jews, the leading the leading principal parties of the Jewish people and the leading personalities as well as many others. In 537, the first groups of Jews were allowed to return. And uh, 516, now the years have gone by and the temple's been rebuilt, but there's still problems. If you read the book of Ezra, which is the book right before the book of Nehemiah, you see that the, a group of Jews was allowed to return back to Jerusalem. But still, even though the temple's rebuilt, the walls are still in shambles. There's no protection. The gates are burned down. In 445 B.C., we started last week where Nehemiah is asking permission from King Artaxerxes to go back and to rebuild the walls. Now, in our series, we haven't got that far just yet. We started last week with talking about leadership, those who are called to leadership, and we discovered that anybody who seeks to influence anybody else, that's basically, bottom line, that's leadership. So if you're a person who seeks to influence other people, then that's a role of leadership. And we talked about the fact that if you're a believer, you're a child of God, you're salt and light in this earth today, that God, that's influence. And that God has called every Christian to be an influencer in the culture that we live in. Now, I know I was listening to Christian radio this week and some pastor came on there briefly and told us that there's nowhere in the Bible Christians are called to be leaders. I started to call him and ask him what Bible that was, but I let alone. I prayed about it and just kept my mouth shut. But that's, that's so ridiculous. You know, I understood the principle he was trying to point out was that we would be servants. But Jesus said, you know, if you're faithful in a little, he'll make you master over much. If you learn how to be a servant, you'll be the leader. And if you are a leader, then you are a servant. So we are called to be leaders. We're called to be people who make a difference in the world around us. The whole idea of being a, a king and a priest unto the Lord is the whole idea of having influence, having a place a, in a position in your life where you make a difference in the world you live in, where you make a difference in whatever school you go to, whatever location you work at, whatever neighborhood you live in, whatever church you attend. You're there not to sit idly by as a spectator, but you're there to participate in the will of God. And in so doing that, you become a leader. God wants you to be a leader. We talked about the reason that God was dealing with Nehemiah was in, in that first chapter was that it became very clear by his reaction to what he was hearing about Jerusalem was is that God had a purpose and a plan for his life. And we'll look at some of those passages this morning. But I do want to remind you of a quote that I read this last week by a guy of the name of Richard Elworth Day. And he made this comment in a book called Filled with the Spirit. He said, it would be no surprise if a study of secret causes were undertaken to find out whatever every golden era of human history. In other words, if we looked at every great move that happened in history, if you looked at it and you did a study, he said, well, he said it, it proceeds from the devotion and the righteous passion of one single individual. There are no bona fide mass movements. It just looks that way. At the center of the column, there will always be one person who knows his God and knows where he's going. In other words, every great move of God begins by, with somebody whom God gets a hold of, who knows God, who knows how to hear from God, and who learns from the Word of God how to relate to that God, and something comes out of that that affects many, many, many people's lives. Nehemiah is that guy in the book of Nehemiah. As you look at his life, we talked about last week, it says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now, it happened in the month of Shizlev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, now, Hanani is his brother, and Hanani comes to give him a report of what's going on in Jerusalem. He said, so I asked him what had happened there, and I asked him about the Jews who'd escaped, and I, and I asked him about those who survived captivity, and how Jerusalem. And he says, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress. And they're, they're suffering and they're suffering a reproach because the walls of Jerusalem is broken down 
and the gates thereof it are burned. So the people in Jerusalem, they're defeated, they're distressed, they're living in despair. Why? Even though the temple's rebuilt, there's no protection. There's no security. There's no way to, pro to provide uh, some kind of force, source of security for the, the way that they're living because the walls are down. And we talked a little bit about walls and how important they were, how that the enemy easily comes in and can take what he wants to take because there were no walls that protected the city. So we look at Nehemiah's life and it says that when Nehemiah said, when I heard this, when I realized what was being he said, he said, I, I wept, I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed. We dealt with this issue about Nehemiah. There were several things we learned about him. One, he's obviously a man who has a sensitivity to spiritual things and what's going on. God is looking for people like that. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. It said he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. We also see about Nehemiah, he was dependable. He's a guy who if you looked at and said, is anybody loyal in the crowd? Everybody would point to Nehemiah. He was entrusted to be the cupbearer for the king. Now the cupbearer, I think we think of only in the context of a guy who would taste the wine or the food for the king to make sure nobody's poisoning the king. But his position was more like that of a prime minister, chief of security. I mean, he's the head of the secret service. He's the guy who the king, Artaxerxes, trusts. He is a chief counselor to the king. And he was born there in that country, even though he's a Jew, his family's been carried into this captivity and he's, he's never even been to Jerusalem as far as scripture takes, takes it. But his heart is in his homeland. And so God takes this man, Nehemiah, and we see something supernatural happen. What hasn't been able to be accomplished over decades and over hundreds of years now happens under the leadership of this one man, Nehemiah. And so we want to look at his life and see what is it that made this guy so effective in motivating people and leading people? What made him effective? Now, this is a message and a series of messages that I first began and shared in our pastor's conference in Bulgaria. Later, I shared it in Belize in our pastor's conferences. Because these are important parts. But not only important parts and principles, laws of leadership for pastors, but for every child of God. We need to know these things and we need to learn how we can be effective. One thing we talked about last week is that leadership can be learned. If that were not so, Jesus would not have spent so much time with those 12 disciples and teaching them every day for three years about how God moves, how God works, how the word of God works, how the people of God live their lives and should live their life and how he lived his life for the glory of God. And one thing they saw about the Lord Jesus Christ was that they, they had a, a lesson constantly before them of learning. And what they learned about him, as we saw in many times, in many places we've been in the scriptures, they learned that Jesus was a man of prayer. So as we look at this today and we talk about the making of a leader, we talked about leadership principles last week and integrity and morality issues, all those things which are missing on so many levels of leadership today, we see them found in the life of Nehemiah. Ian Bounds made this great statement. I have this book on my, on my table in my office. You walk into the table there. And the book called The Power of Prayer. And then he said, you know, we are constantly on a stretch, talking about the church, if not a strain, to provide new methods and new plans and new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency. But men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. This is the nutshell, in a nutshell, of everything that we've said so far. Even long after that and long before that same principle has been laid out in the Word of God. Ezekiel 22. I search for what? A program? No. I search for a man, a woman among them who would build up the wall, stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. So even another passage in Chronicles says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone, some person. In other words, we may be looking for methods and techniques and organization that God says, I'm looking for people to use. I'm looking for people who can be functional in the kingdom of God. I'm looking for leaders. And one of the things we stated last week, and I think it's in the, in the context of what Richard Day was saying in that quote I read earlier, nothing really happens until someone provides leadership. Nothing really goes on until God is able to get a, a hold of the heart of that person and begin a work in that person and then something happens. I don't believe anything really happens in a nation until there's genuine godly leadership. Things don't happen in your home until there's genuine godly leadership. Things don't happen in the church until there's genuine godly leadership. We look for mechanics. We look for methods. We look for motivation. God says, I'm just looking for someone I can use. 
I think the leadership laws, we've talked about principles and laws of leadership that we'd look at today would be this, is the effectiveness of my public leadership is really determined by my private life. Now that's not believed hardly anymore. People think their private life is not important where they are on the character scale and the moral scale and integrity issues, not a big deal. You know, can I do the job? Well, the Bible teaches very clearly to effectively do the job, to do a job that's gonna last, do a job that really means something and that ultimately can change people's lives. The leadership you provide is gonna be determined first and foremost by your private life. What we'll do in this lesson today is we'll just look in the heart of Nehemiah and see one thing about Nehemiah for sure, that he's a man who has the attention of God because he's a man whose heart belongs to God and he, it's, it's clarified by the fact that he's a man of prayer. There's about, I said last week, about 11 prayers in the book. Nine of these are Nehemiah and, 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 and that he's written out for us. And they're written out clearly and I think God gives us these prayers to let us learn some lessons about what real prayer is like. And if we are going to be effective in our leadership, we need to learn how to pray like this. One thing I always want to do in scripture is find prayers that work, amen? Prayers that God answers, prayers that God is moving on and see what, how that's constructed, how that works. Because we want to learn how to be the kind of leader God wants to be. We need to learn to pray. And you see this becomes a real obvious thing in Nehemiah's life. In fact, we'll ask three questions we'll seek to answer today. One is when should I pray? Why should I pray? How should I pray? Those are pretty good questions to ask. Now, we've talked a lot about prayer, but I think that even though we talk about it, we still haven't got the, all of the fact that we need to do it. We need, we need to pray. You say, well, Brother Joe, let's answer the first question. When should I pray? Well, if you follow the story of Nehemiah, when he gets the news about Jerusalem, the first thing he does is get with God. I sat down, I wept, I mourned, I prayed. I got alone. I got in a place where I could hear God speak. When should I pray? In fact, I, I believe the answer here is all the time about everything. Whatever you're dealing with. In verse four, it says, I prayed for some days. In fact, it starts out, he gets that message in the month of Shizlev. That sounds like a hip hop term or something, doesn't it? It's in the Shizlev, man. I got, in the month of Shizlev, and what happens, he goes down, he gives this report. And before he ever goes to King Artaxerxes and gets the answer to, his, to, to, to going and being able to go and get permission to go, four months go by. So in reality, he's prayed for four months before he acts on this particular prayer. But he's praying this and he's, 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 he's going through and, and he's getting a word from God. Now, we live in the Houston Metroplex kind of area here. I mean, we have all these little suburban communities from Conroe to, Bay, you know, to, to Beaumont. All this is one big area. And one thing you find in cities like this is a lot of type A personalities. People got to get it done. I mean, there's a, let's tackle it now. Let's go get it. Let's, whatever. We're going to fix it if it needs to be fixed. We're going to build it if it needs to be built. We're going to tear it down if it needs to be tore down. And as a result of these type A personalities, we also have a lot of heart centers. <laughs> because people have a lot of heart attacks in communities that are filled with type A personalities. Because we set out to do stuff, but we don't do the most important stuff before we do the stuff. And the most important stuff before we do the big stuff, the biggest stuff is to pray. Slow down to get a word from God, to see what God's doing. Nehemiah's praying and he's not shooting up a four second prayer. There's four months go by that he's talking to the Lord about this, you know. But we're living in a, in a culture that just breeds this in us that we just get too busy. I'm just too busy to pray. I, I, you know, I need to go. I got to go do the work of God. Well, we don't even know what the will of God is to do the work of God. Because we don't pray. There's several occasions, you've looked at this, and there's about nine prayers that he journals for us. And the whole book of Nehemiah is like a, a journal. And he's journaling this whole event and what's, it was what's happening. And now understand, what he does is supernatural here. This is an incredible event. A lot of guys before Nehemiah have tackled this task of rebuilding the walls and the gates. All right, but they have not succeeded. And what they had tried to do for hundreds of years gets done in 52 days. 52 days by this man, Nehemiah, as he leads the way. But it's all bathed in this prayer and every event's bathed in prayer. In chapter one, we, we, we read a little of that prayer in, in, verses, in, in verses four through 11, and I'll read all of that in just a moment. But he's received the news. He sat down, he weeps and prays, and then he voices this prayer that goes through verse five through 11. And as he voicing that prayer, the summary of that prayer is this, God, I, you're a holy God. And you know, I'm, I'm asking you here for a hearing. I need to talk to you. 
I'm, I'm, I'm confessing my sin. I'm confessing the sins of the nation. And I need help to approach the king. You say, well, did that prayer accomplish anything? Obviously, the most important thing, he's now including God in the situation. He's now including God in the plan and in the concerns. He's now getting to the place where God is now going to work in his heart. And get. And as Nehemiah gives room for God to work, God begins to work. The second prayer is in chapter 2. And it's during a conversation as he's praying with God. He asks God, and the summary of the prayer is this. Here's what you can do to help, Lord God, the king. Why do we need help with the king? Because the king's already told everybody, no one's rebuilding the walls. Nobody's rebuilding those gates. You know, that's just the way it's going to be. That's the law. So, he, he's, you know, the, the heart of his prayer is, you know, hey, I'm, I need you to help with the king. You know, so what's happening here? The expectation is simple. I'm putting all this in your hands, God, and I'm expecting some results from you in this regard. The third prayer is in chapter four, and I don't have these on the overhead if you're looking for them back there. Just chill out. All right. As he goes and he starts doing some things, what happens? Trouble begins to rise. Now, this is where our thinking is not correct. We think that if I ask God for help, then that means there's not going to be any trouble. But what happens, anytime you assume a place where you're going to lead or you're seeking to influence, get ready. I mean, if you walk around my house today and you start disturbing some bushes and some plants, you know what's going to happen? Mosquitoes are going to come out of there. All right. And they're going to seek to bite you. All right. You say, Brother Joe, I need to clean the brush up and clean the plants up. But there's going to be some problems. All right. No matter what you do, anytime you choose to stir the water a little bit, there's going to be some problems. Anytime you say, hey, you know, Brother Joe's right. I need to be a leader at my school or I need to be a leader on my job. There's going to be some problems. And this next prayer is, is the fact that when he gets down into Jerusalem, guess what's happening? In chapter four, there's problems. He's taunted. He's ridiculed. Tobiah and Sambalat. And we'll deal with those. And so he goes to God and he prays, God, they're mocking you. So I'm going to let you decide what to do with them. Why? I got to build a wall. You told me to do something. I'm not going to be distracted. What happened? So now he's just put those results in God's hand. He's angry about what's going on, but he's expressed that to God. He said, I'm not going to take care of this myself. God, I'm going to put these matters into your hand. Well, that'd save you a lot of time right there, wouldn't it? The next prayer is, is the threats are still coming in chapter four. So he tells God, summary of the prayer, we're in your hands. We'll keep our weapons handy, though, <laughs> in case you need us. We're going to do whatever you have. We're going to keep working. But Lord, I have my sword here if you'd like me to use it. So he's prepared, all right? So what's happening here? He's just expressing, I trust you, God. I'm believing you. I'm looking to you. I'll take any necessary precautions. I'll be ready to do whatever you tell me to do. Chapter six, there's more threats coming. He prays again, Lord, please strengthen me. And God begins to strengthen him mentally, emotionally, because, hey, whenever there's problems, it does affect us mentally and emotionally. We start getting stressed out. What do you do with that? Well, Nehemiah committed to the Lord. So what's he doing? He's just, again, telling God, you are my stability. You are my peace. You're my strength. I'm not paying attention to these guys. You're going to deal with them, but I'll be ready. Chapter 13, he's still reflecting on the actions of his enemies. So this is something he keeps praying about, obviously. And again, he, say, he says, God, I trust you to deal with the enemies and I trust you to thwart their evil plans. What's that do? It removes him. And this is the result of praying like this because we, we, a lot of times we just want God to kill our enemies, right? You wouldn't say it out loud, but I'll say it for you. <laughs> God, get rid of my enemies. If not kill them, move them somewhere else, right? So what is he saying? Lord, you know, I, I, I'm not going to respond to this compulsion to get revenge. I'm going to trust you and I'm going to trust your justice. You're going to take care of these things. In chapters 5, he, he's praying. In chapters 13, he's praying. But it all gets down in those chapters as he prays. He's just reflecting on, on, on his efforts to serve God. And what he says in those prayers in a nutshell is, God, remember me. Now, first of all, it seems a little strange for someone to ask God to remember. But, you know. <laughs> but he's again calling it him because really what he's doing, we tell God to remember us, we're remembering God. And so what happens? Nehemiah's just keeping clear in his own mind, what his motives are and what he's there to do. Because it is so easy when we move forward to lead things, that our, our motives get jumbled, uh, we lose clarity, we lose motivation. And so he's keeping everything before God. He is a man of action. He's going to do some things. He is an organizer. He is a motivator. He's never been a wall builder, but he's getting ready to be one, even though he's never been one, all right? Nehemiah is a guy who gets things done. He wouldn't have the position that he had 
in the country where he was if he had not been a guy who gets things done. He builds this wall, as we said, in, in 52 days. But what do you do if you're going to do something big and supernatural and incredible? You get alone with God. Nehemiah's a man of prayer. When should I pray? All time about everything. You, know, you, you talk to God. The second thing is, why should I pray? We ask the question. I'll give you a couple of reasons here. One, it truly is the evidence that my faith and my dependence is upon God. Remember Jesus, as he's dealing with his disciples, it's the day before the crucifixion. He has them in the upper room. They take the covenant meal, the Lord's Supper together. He's telling them even there, without me, you can do nothing. I mean, these are final words. Jesus just telling them, here's what you're going to do. Here's how it's going to be. But remember, without me, you can do nothing. So as we pray, what are we doing? We're just acknowledging God. You said without you, I can't do anything. And Lord, guess what? I've discovered that I can't do anything. In Matthew chapter five, you have the Beatitudes, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? Blessed are the folks who realize they ain't got nothing to offer. Blessed are the folks who realize they need God. Blessed are the people who realize it's not by might, not by my power, but by the Holy Spirit, says the Lord. Blessed are those folks. How do we express that? We do that first and foremost in prayer. Now, the second reason we pray and why we pray this way is because simply it lightens the load. You say, That's, where's the depth of that? Hey, listen, I don't know about you, but there's times in my life and more often than I would like to admit it, that I'm extremely burdened about stuff. I'm carrying a heavy load. As you do, you face times in your life. It might be in your personal life. It might be in your family life, be in your home or on your job. But there, there's just something you're dealing with. It's big and it's a burden and it's heavy and it's hard to bear and it's hard to carry and it's difficult and you don't see the end and you don't know if there will be an end. You're just not sure how to even handle it. But here's what happens when you learn how to pray. You begin now to do what, well, in Proverbs, when we did our series in Proverbs, in chapter 16, one of the last chapters we did here in, in, our, in our Magnolia campus was, cast your cares upon me. Commit your ways into the Lord. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. The simple principle of wisdom was that I'm putting everything, this heavy burden I'm carrying, I'm putting it all over on the Lord because I cannot carry this. I have to share this burden. I love that old hymn that says, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. Jesus will heal me. He will hear me. He, what's he do? He comes and carries the burden. Uh, that's, Nehemiah, you know what his name literally means in the Hebrew? His name means the Lord is my comfort. I can't deal with this, but God can, and God will be my comfort. I believe that God literally, genuinely lift the heaviness of the burden that you're bearing. Take my yoke upon you. It's light. What's he say would do with your yoke? Cast it on him. Cast your burdens on me. Cast your cares on me. How often do we see this in scripture? We just have to get to the place where we literally say it to God though. We, don't, we just kind of acknowledge it in our head. No, we get with God. We say, Lord, you said those that wait upon you, those who meet with you, those who spend time with you, those that waited, you would renew their strength. You said in Isaiah, you will, that we would mount up with wings as eagles, that we would run and not be weary, that we could walk and not faint. God, I'm about to pass out here. <laughs> Amen. And so what do you, you acknowledge the Lord and you bring him into the scenario of everything that's going on in your life. You invite his presence in and you roll those burdens onto him. Guess what? He can and will carry those burdens. The third reason, it's God's way of moving in our world. That's why we pray. This is the way God, nothing else releases God's prayer but the prayer of faith. God's power. Nothing releases God's power like the prayer of faith. I mean, the first days I got saved, somebody said, hey, bro, Joe, Joe, you know, what the, you know what God's phone number is? I said, what's God's phone number? Jeremiah 33, 3. What's Jeremiah 33, 3 say? Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you know not. How many of y'all know that verse? You know that verse. You've heard that. Call unto me, but yet we don't call unto him. And what we're doing is we're missing the very resource we're missing the very power and the presence of God working in our life in an active way simply because we just don't ask. We don't call. We don't trust the Lord. We have to ask, though. I gave you a quote from Ian Bounds' book on prayer a while ago, but let me give you one more where he talks about the importance of prayer. It says, prayer is the channel through which all good flows to men. 
Prayer is a privilege, a sacred princely privilege. Prayer is a duty, an obligation most binding and most imperative, which should hold us to it. But prayer is more than a privilege and more than a duty. It is the appointed condition of getting God's aid. It is the avenue through which God supplies man's want. Prayer. Well, that's powerful. Some of you are in here today and you're tired. You just wore out. You've been dealing with this. It's hurting you. You're holding on to it. And it's now it's time to release those things to get with God and pray and say, God, I need you and, and I'm holding on to you. And it's not just one prayer. I mean, Nehemiah's praying this particular issue for four months. And then when he gets there, he's continuing to pray over it all. I think sometimes we give our little prayer to God and we suspect, okay, I prayed about it. And then we go do whatever we're going to do and we miss God completely because we did what we just thought best. But prayer will tap you to the very resources of God. When God gets brought in, introduced into the project, then those things that seem to be impossible, they become glorious possibilities. The third question was, how should I pray? If you have your Bible open, Right after 1st, 2nd Chronicles, there's Ezra, and then comes Nehemiah. I don't have the, these particular verses on the screen, but they are the prayer, all right? All right. You have a little sample of this prayer in verses 5 through 11. And in it are the four principles that we'll just conclude the message with today. But he says this, verse 5, I said, I beseech, here he's praying. I said, he's journaling the prayer for us. I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and the loving kindness for those who love him and those who keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly against you, very corruptly, you and against you, and you have and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there. I will bring them to the place where I've chosen to cause my name to be to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. This man was the king that he's praying about. So he's praying here and he gives us a real simple illustration, you know, just by looking at this prayer, the kind of prayers that we should pray. And I am so glad that the Holy Spirit of God moved on Nehemiah to have him record these things for us. And, he's, and I believe this is a synopsis of everything he's praying over the four months of time. So he says, Lord, here's my prayer. And this is the basis, the, the four points you would see. First of all, I base my request on God's character. He starts with verse five. God, you're, you're a great God. God of heavens, you're great, you're awesome. You keep your promises to those who, who, who love you, who obey your commands. What's he saying about God? In this first verse, he's just extolling the character of God. He said, God, you're great. You're awesome, you keep your word. What's he doing? He's recognizing God's position. Hey, I don't know what your problem is, or what position it holds in your thinking. It may seem bigger than everything else in your life right now, but God is bigger. And what prayer will do is it gets God back in his rightful place in your own mind. God knows he's great and awesome. I don't have to tell him that. I need to hear it. All right. I need to hear it. God, you're awesome. You're greater. I have a problem. You're bigger than my problem. This is what he's saying here. You, you're, you're the God of all things. He's acknowledging who God is and he's acknowledging God's greatness. God, we have a mess in Jerusalem. You're in charge. They're your people. It's your city. It's where your name dwells. I mean, I believe he's starting off with the right perspective. We learn we enter in God's presence with thanksgiving, with praise. That's what he's doing here. So I, but he's doing more than that. He's, he's, he's expressing the character of God that he's awesome. There's no greater authority you're, you're over all things. You're God of all things. 
So he's entering in. The second thing he does here, the important thing is he's confessing sin, not just his sin, but everybody's sin. All right. You want your prayers answered? You have to deal with the sin in your life. Period. A lot of us are begging God for stuff, but we're not willing to obey God. You can beg all day long, but you need to realize the promises of God are based upon a relationship and a relationship between you and God that your heart's right with him. That your life is right with him. He says here, we've disobeyed you, God, in this prayer. We didn't do what you said. We have done, we have performed very wickedly. We, we, we have committed sins against you. We've acted very wicked. We didn't obey your commands or your decrees or your laws. First part of the prayer is, is on who God is. Guess what the second part of the prayer is? Who we are. God, we, we've, we've rejected you. I confess my sins. I confess my father's house sins. I've confessed the nation's sins. Now, understand, it wasn't Nehemiah's fault. He hadn't been born yet that the nation went into captivity. But the nation's in captivity. You know what we've lost in our country? This mindset of unity and oneness that we are the American people. We can sit back and point at our politicians all day long who've done wickedly, but we need to all confess we've done wickedly. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have a politician who would get up tomorrow and say, I'm running for president of the United States, but I'd like to pray first. And he prays a prayer like, Lord, let your ears be attentive, your eyes be open to the prayers of your servant. That I'm praying before you every day. I'm praying, for, I'm praying for it to you every night. And I'm praying for all your servants, the people of the nation. So I confess, Lord, that we, your people, including myself and my father's house, we've committed sins against you. And we've acted, Father, very wickedly towards you. And we haven't obeyed your commands or your laws that you've laid down for your, some of your servant Moses. That'd get an ear, wouldn't it? You know? The beauty of this is, you know, he's not blaming anybody. He's taking responsibility. Daniel does the same thing when he's praying for the nation. Lord, we're a wicked people. We have sinned against you. This is national confession. But we're, we're too individualistic to realize that. You know, well, you know, they did that. You know, that's their problem. Well, I mean, we're taught kind of in the Bible to confess our sins, right? I don't confess anybody else's sins. But we are a common group of people. When's the last time you confessed the sins of the nation? You know, the rebellion against God. We don't think that way, you know. Our society is is taught the concept, you know, you're just responsible for you. Forget that brother's keeper stuff. Here's here's, here's the cop-out phrase. You know, I I know, I know what happened. I just need to do what's best for me. That's a quick way to ruin your marriage. It's a quick way to ruin your life. It's a quick way to ruin your job. It's a quick way to ruin your church. It's a quick way to ruin everything in your life. All kinds of stuff gets justified with that phrase. Well, Brother Joe, I just need to do what's best for me. I've seen people leave churches. I've seen people leave relationships, leave their marriages, all over this thing. I just got to do it. I got to take care of myself. Let me give you an important principle about being a leader. Leaders accept the blame. They don't pass the buck. What's wrong in Washington today? Nobody takes blame for the mess. I mean, the, our, I don't care what political table you sit at. They have royally messed the nation up. Royally. I mean, this is nowhere near what the founding fathers had imagined and fought and bled and died for. It. We are messed up. And I want you to know, if I had my say, everybody would lose their job to tomorrow. Because everybody's failed up there, as far as I'm concerned. And here's what, here's what shows you the height of their failure. Oh, it's the Republicans' fault. George Bush's fault. No, it's Obama's fault. Or it's the Democrats' fault. No, it's... And everybody's... Nobody will accept blame for their mess. And the things that they did out of ignorance or stupidity and mostly out of selfishness to get some kind of element of power. We need to all get back like, God, we sinned against you. We're in trouble. The difference between, you know, that person who's a leader and a loser, losers are excusers. Losers are accusers. It's not my fault. Hey, you're in this party as well as everybody else is. It's our fault. And the church is at fault. The nation's at fault. We need to get back to the place to confess our sins to God. God, you're holy. We haven't been righteous. We've been unrighteous. David said, Lord, against you and you only have we sinned. We've got to get back to accountability with God. 
confess our sins. Quit blaming your wife. Quit blaming your husband. Quit blaming your kids. Quit blaming the economy. Quit blaming God. God, I've messed up. I, need to get, I, need, I haven't been faithful. Take some blame in your life. Take some blame for the world around you. See what God will do. He certainly does something in Nehemiah's life. The third part I want to talk to you about a prayer we see in this prayer, he's just claiming the promises of God. And we've talked about this often, about how important it is to know the word of God so you can trust God for his promises. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses. That's an important line. I'm praying based on what, what you've said, God. I'm, this prayer is based on what you've promised. If you are unfaithful, you told us, you'd scatter us. We're scattered. If you return to me and obey my commands, even if you're exiled from the farthest horizon, I'll bring you back. I'll get you from there. I'll bring you to the place you've chosen where you've chosen to put your name. I mean, notice how many times, if and I will, if and I, but aren't all the promises, if we confess our sins, God said, I will forgive you. If we'll seek his face, humble ourselves, pray, turn from our wicked ways and fast, God said, I will heal your land. Over and over again, it's this simple principle, principle of getting God involved and in moving in a real way in your life by responding to the ifs. If you'll get right, if you'll listen to me, if you'll love me, if you'll follow me, if you'll trust me, over and over again. And God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. It's always interesting. Again, I'll bring it up. Maybe you can catch it a while ago. When Nehemiah is praying, he says, Lord, Lord, I want you to remember what you told your sermon. You can be sure God remembers what he said. But again, I think this is more for Nehemiah's remembrance. But I think more than that, it is the key principle of all praying. It's based on what God said. Praying is just finding what God has said and agreeing with it. Until it happens. You're holding on. You're trusting. You're believing. You've got, you got to fight against that and resist that urge to start doubting and giving up and quitting on God. You stay at it. You stay with it. You keep trusting. And you keep reminding your father who knows already. But the Bible says we have not because we ask not. So this prayer, which is ultimately just based upon our relationship, is responded to because you're reminding God who you are and you're reminding God who it is. You look, this is the way God moved in the scripture. All the prophets. This is the way Jesus lived his life. Uh, what I do, he says, the words I say, it's what the father told me to say. The acts I do, it's what the father told me to do. That's the way our life is lived. So it says, oh, Nehemiah, said, God, I want to remind you of the promises you made. And then he shares it. Does God have to be reminded? No. Does he forget what he promised? No. Then why do we do it? Because it's the way we remember who we're trusting and who we're looking to and who we're believing. I've shared that this passage of scripture with you. I don't know how many times in the last 20 plus years of ministry here. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. How do we get everything pertaining to life and godliness? Through the knowledge, the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and by his own excellencies. For by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises so that by them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, escaping the corruption that's in the world through lust. I don't know about you as a parent growing up. I don't think my kids ever forgot one promise I made. Amen. We need to be those kind of kids with the heavenly father. Those kids who know what the promises are, who listen to the promises, who hear them and remember them and then remind them prayer folks it just it transforms those promises of God in, in, into performance it's where I take God and hold him his word up to him and say I trust you and Nehemiah said God I'm, I'm basing my prayer on on who you are upon your character what you what you said someone well put it this way he says God never shuts his storehouse until you shut your mouth <laughs> isn't that good God doesn't stop to shut the storehouse until you shut your mouth so Nehemiah is claiming promises. You know, the promises he mentioned, we're looking up specifically ones in Leviticus 26, 33, and other ones in Deuteronomy 30, verse 4. When's the last time in prayer you took a promise back to the Father? When's the last time you took one out of Leviticus? <laughs> Amen. We, we have to be in the Word to know what the Word says, though. The point is this. The strength of your prayer life and the strength of my prayer life, I really believe is determined on how well I know the Word of God and the promises of God. And if I'm not familiar with them, I'm going to miss it completely. The fourth and last is this. Be specific in what you ask for. He says here in verse 10, they're your servants, your people, you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Let your ears be attentive. And then he goes down, he gets real specific. 
I'm asking you to give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I'm going to the king, and I'm going to ask him to do something. Up to, basically, I mean, I don't think he's hesitant in any way to pray for success. I'm asking for success in this venture. I'm getting ready to do something. I believe you called me to do it, but I need you to give me success. I'm ready to go to Jerusalem. I'm available to go to Jerusalem. Now, on the other hand, we don't know what Artaxerxes, the king's going to say. This is his right-hand guy. This is the guy he trusts so much, so much that he realizes this guy can't be bribed so as to get me poisoned. <laughs> you know, I could lose my life here. Remember we said he, he's that chief security agent. Is he going to let him go? I mean, this is your right-hand guy. In fact, when Nehemiah goes, ultimately asking, he's asking for a leave for up to three years if necessary to get the walls rebuilt, to rebuild the town. Who the king had ordered that can be rebuilt. But he's asking for success. Let me ask you today. What are you asking for success in? Well, nothing. Then what's the alternative to success? Failure. Now, Nehemiah, remember, this is this is this is this prayer we see written out here. I believe it's the evolved prayer over four years of time. It's the synopsis of everything he's been praying for. You know, it's like this. Uh, some of y'all get the prayer request on the prayer line, right? And you, you read a prayer, so-and-so has cancer, or so-and-so broke their leg or was in a car accident. You see something, you say, oh, and your heart's touched, right? In that moment, you kind of, oh, Lord, help them, you know? That's probably where Nehemiah's prayer started. It says when Hanani, his brother, told him about the distress and the depression, despair in Jerusalem, he said, I wept, I mourned to pray. He it probably, I mean, he didn't know what to pray at this point, I believe. I just, I, you know, I, Lord, help him. Lord, do something, build the walls up, make something, you know, raise somebody up. You know, and in the prayers, it begins to evolve. It goes something like this. Lord, they need, they need a man. Long pause. You know that time when you pray and you kind of this pause, but you, all of a sudden you hear God speak to your heart about something? You the man? <laughs> so I believe, I, I don't think that when he first heard this, this very moment, we, we, he gets to that point. But I think in this four months of praying, and seeking God's face and knowing what to do and how to handle the problem and how to deal with the situation. God brings you to this place. Here I am, Lord, send me. If I'm the guy, I'm ready. But I can't go if you don't deal with that guy. And it's amazing. He doesn't go in and, and do what a lot of people do, start trying to manipulate the situation. You know, try to sweet talk the king and do all the right things, you know. And, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. We all know when mama wants her way. She can be real sweet. When daddy wants his way, he can be real nice. What can I do for you, baby? Oh, by the way, did I tell him I'm going to play golf for three days next week? <laughs> I think this period of time, God's moving and God's working. I need, imagine Nehemiah just started with something like, God, you, you got to do something about that, that mess over there. You might have prayed that for a number of days like that. Then it starts, you know, Lord, you, you, you know, I don't know what's going to happen over there. And then in this period, somewhere in this process, he begins to believe he's the guy. He begins to realize he's the guy. He begins to have this expectation of seeing the wall go up. In his mind, it's happening. The walls are being built. He begins to see it's, it, the vision is being formed in his heart and his mind. And the more he prays it, the more he sees it. And then he gets to the point, now he has to expect some great big stuff from God if it's ever going to happen. It was William Carey, the father of modern day missionaries who founded the modern mission movement as we see it today. He said, expect great things from God and do great things for God. Isn't that a great thing? Expect great things from God and do great things for God. The summary of that whole thing of that prayer is there's four marks of his prayer. It goes like this. First of all, as we said, it's a prayer of conviction. It's my conviction that God is just. It's my conviction that God is awesome. It's my conviction that God is in control. It's my conviction that God wants me to speak to him. It's my conviction that God wants to answer my prayers. It's my conviction that, that God wants me to acknowledge who he is. And I'm just going to brag on God at this point. The second part of his prayer was this. It's confession. God, I've blown it. We as a people have blown it. We've made mistakes. We've had sins. We've had failures. Lord, we're not perfect. And you've seen our imperfection in action. And he's specific. Three, it's a prayer of confidence in what God has promised. He's claiming the word of God. I know who you are. I know who I am. I know what you've said. God, you said it. I'm believing it now. And that's going to settle it for all eternity. You have said it. That settles it. 
and God's claiming the promise. You know, there's like 7,000 promises that God makes to his people in scripture. 7,000. Did you hear about the story about the guy who, who went to heaven and he got to heaven and noticed all these warehouses everywhere? And wherever you look, there are warehouses. Warehouses. So what's in those warehouses? So I'll show you. So he goes in the warehouses, you know, and he sees all this stuff. I mean, there's cars, there's blessings, you know, there, there's neat, all, all this stuff. It's all in these warehouses just filled up everywhere he turns. He's seeing all this stuff and everyone has, has a tag hanging off of it. He says, can I see one of those tags? He says, yeah. He looks at the tag and it says the same thing on everyone. It says, never ask for. Never ask for. It's what James said, you have not because you ask not. We have a confidence in God and we pray with that confidence. We don't pray with, oh, I hope you come through, God. You said you'd come through. So you're coming through. You're meeting the need. But also realize it's a prayer of commitment. Nehemiah has put himself in a situation to say, I'll be part of the answer in any way you want it to happen. I'll be part of the solution. If you can use me, then use me. I'm willing to lead. So what do we say? I think the first step in all leadership is to have, make sure to have a private life. A private life that's just between you and the Father. A private life of devotion results in a real genuine walk of God where you're just not going through the motions of being a church person. But you're a mover and a shaker in the kingdom of God. Let's stand with our heads bowed.